Hello and welcome to episode 239 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leeds. Damien, how are you doing? I'm I'm good, Andy. I am well, I'm really pumped about this week because obviously we've got the Money to the Masses event, which I will come on to. But my brain is pretty fried because I've been doing a lot of events in the last week. So um, Andy's been at one of them. We did a an event that was for money bloggers, basically, people who write about money as a, almost a, a sideline, kind of like what Money to the Masses did in the beginning. And we went to that. I did a talk, which I'm going to be based on one of the pieces today, for uh, Hearst UK, which is the company that makes all these women's magazines or a number of women's magazines and men's health so that's things like good housekeeping so they did a event that I was asked to speak at so I've been doing a lot of that stuff so yeah I'm pretty t- I'm pretty tired at this point <laughs> and, and it doesn't help that we're doing this podcast relatively early compared to our normal <laughs> <things>. <laughs> no just to let you in behind the curtain we're doing it early in the morning because I've now got to go to the hospital after this to get my infusion for my Crohn's so uh, it's all good and so I'm just going to recuperate recharge because yeah. we're really pumped about next week. So we're going to talk about that very briefly, first of all, aren't we? Yeah, let's do that now. Um, don't forget, Money to the Masses event, live a champagne lifestyle on a lemonade budget, which is on Tuesday at the General Assembly. And the amazing thing is, I am so chuffed because we started off, if you remember, we had 200 spaces, then it went to 300. Well, it was able, in the end, we, we were able to push it to 600 spaces. And um, this week, that completely filled up. So there were 600 people who registered to come to the event, which is pretty mind-blowing. So please make sure you come. I know it's a free event, but if you registered for a ticket, do come because there's a waiting list. There's lots of people who want to come, but who can't. So please, please make sure you do turn up on Tuesday. It's going to be a really good event. We've got a great panel. And most importantly of all, I really want to meet you all. So if when you come, make sure you hang around and say hello and have your picture taken with me for our benefit so we can keep them and share them on social media. Because this has been an event a long time in the making, almost a decade of Money to the Masses. And it's the first event we've done. And it's the one time that I'm going to be able to meet people and talk to them about what we do and about them and just it's really good to go out there because we learn a lot from events because you listen to what people talk to you about so we learn as much as we teach people so it'll be a good fun event you're going to love it so make sure you get there early that's the one thing I would say because obviously if there's that many people coming we want to make sure you get in easily and quickly because you are going to have to um, as you come in give your name to make sure you're on the on the list for security reasons apparently yeah and that's right and there's lots of people coming as, as you've already said Damien and the event itself is going to last about an hour or so we'll have a time afterwards for a bit of a meet and greet and chat and we'll have a camera crew there who if you want to um, maybe asking you some questions about the event but also crucially there is a time limit to how long we can stay in the event we'll be moving on after won't we and we'll be going to a pub and we'll be carrying on the the kind of the chats and everything else yeah so do bear that in mind if you want to stay around with us and have a few drinks and there's a pub we're going to just around the corner as I mentioned in a previous podcast a podcast listener actually owns that pub and runs it and so we're going to go to that pub we've got a space in there so we can have some drinks and we can continue the conversation because we can't stay in the venue too late so we can't stay on there beyond about I think it's eight o'clock eight thirty so we're going to probably decamp to the pub fairly quickly so we can just continue the evening and have some fun so absolutely pumped about the event mind blown thank you all for coming i can't wait to see you all i know there's some people who are regulars who will come along to that event who we've met at previous events so make sure you do say hello don't come along and hang back make sure you get around and say hello to me andy justin lauren and the team so it's going to be fantastic good okay so what else have we got coming up on the pod this week so one of the pieces we're going to do this week is a around the event that i did on tuesday i think uh it's called financially fabulous and it was an event exclusively for women and i mean if a man had gone they wouldn't have actually minded but it's an event run by hearst uk like i said who do who run the magazines red good housekeeping and they created an event that was for women to teach them the steps to invest in and i was on a panel at that event so what i want to do is pull out some of the things that we are asked and some of the topics we discussed because it'd be very interesting for everybody not just women it's just about a bit of a a 101 on investing really so i'm going to just quick fire some of those questions and give you the answers the next piece we're going to do is going to be around investing if you want to be a day trader now it's not a anything i would get into but 
it's a question that you get asked at some of these events about day trading, buying shares versus investing in funds. And day trading is um is a bit of an extreme version of share trading. Some people buy portfolios of shares and hold them for the long term. Day traders tend to try and um, exploit short term patterns. And I, I want to do a little piece about that if people are interested. It shines a light on day trading and some of the dangers. The final piece is something Andy's got to do actually. At the conference that we went to at the beginning of the week, it was to do with lots of um, money bloggers and people like that. There was a, a bit of a fair there, so companies could come and um, talk to people about what they do. And in fact, we were at that fair, weren't we? We were on the stands because we were talking about our money MOT and explaining what it does and so people can help really get the message out there. But one of the other people or companies there was one that was, it's called the Vulnerability Registration Service, VRS. And it's a service that we're going to, Andy's going to talk about, but it's something to help people who are vulnerable. And um, if you've got a gambling problem, if you've uh, had periods of manic spending, if you have a, an elderly relative who you're worried about being exploited by companies, do listen to that piece because it's a, an interesting company, a non-profit organisation, and we're going to cover that in detail. Good. So what are we going to start with this week? Financially fabulous. We're going to talk about that piece. So I was on a panel with a, a lady called Claire Barrett, who is fantastic. She's from the Financial Times. And if you get the chance, she writes for the Financial Times. She's the personal finance editor, actually. And her pieces are fantastic if you get the chance to read them. The FT has been free for a number of days this week and a bit of a promotion. And she also appears on radio. So she is very good at cutting through the jargon. Um, I know you might think that the Financial Times journalists wouldn't do that but they do and she's particularly good at it which is why she appears on the radio every now and then and just getting to the point and she's also quite funny so she's a very good person to have on one of those panels you get a nice dynamic and she's very knowledgeable the other person on it was a lady called helena morrissey who is actually a dame and she used to be a fund manager many moons ago and a very successful one and had a career and she also wrote a a book called a good time to be a girl don't lean in change the system which was uh, very popular and successful so do have a read of that if you're interested so there was the three of us on the panel with a room of about 100 or so women in the audience and the aim of it was just to try and educate them or answer questions and a general discussion about getting started on investing now the audience was more knowledgeable than i thought it would be i thought it was going to be aimed at the very beginners but there were lots of people there who own stocks and shares isis so it's quite an interesting discussion it made for some really interesting questions so i'm going to just run through some of the questions that i was asked that i can remember and people may find it useful they were in no particular order by the way they're they're almost at random So uh, one of the questions I was asked is, is now a good time to invest? And given Brexit and the various different things out there, and the short answer is there is never a good time to invest. So there is never a good time, there is never a bad time to invest either. It's just there is a time to invest. If you try and predict what's going to happen in the future, you're going to always struggle. So do you know my analogy on this? What's that? It's, It's about having a baby. If you wait until you can afford to have a baby, you'll never have a baby. So you've just got to have a baby and then get on with it because the money is quite a good, bad, I, bad I, analogy. I, no, I do think that's actually true. I think <laughs> it's nothing's ever perfect because um, what Andy's trying to say there is that you can never quite predict how soon or whether you will be able to have one. And f- investing is in a quirky way. I get the analogy because you don't know wh- what Brexit's going to be. You don't know if it's going to happen. You don't know what version you're going to get. And I know a lot of people who, well, I've had emails from a lot of people who are lamenting the fact that they've missed out on the rally in the stock market year to date. Of course, the market could crash tomorrow, but they stayed out of the market because they were nervous about what happened at the back end of last year. And as a result, by trying to second guess things, you sometimes what you tend to do, you end up being too fearful or too greedy. So your emotions start to lead you. So there is never a good or bad time to invest in in all honesty, because you'll never catch the bottom or the top of the market at the right time. So the two best things you can do is drip in, because then if you drip into the market, pound cost averaging, it means that if the market does tumble, then you're buying more shares or more units in the fund at a lower and lower price. If the market then rebounds, which over the long term, it inevitably will do, you just don't know when that will be. It could be a month, it could be six months, could be a decade. You will make more money in that regard if you're dripping in and if you just put all your money in as one lump sum up front of course conversely if the market rallied straight away you would be better off putting your money as a lump sum at the beginning but you just don't know that so 
drip feeding in if you're worried about the market is a sensible strategy but also extending your time horizon they're almost the two things you can do because the longer your time horizon the more likely you are going to get to a point where your portfolio is above where you started so if you think about the dot-com bubble burst so that burst back in sort of the two year 2000 it took quite a long time for the market to get back above the level of where we were then so it was near the financial crisis so after the financial crisis the market collapsed again and we had to wait a long time till we got back above those levels but inevitably it does and part of that is just because of inflation it's the sort of supply and demand uh, there is a general recovery in economics so if you extend your time frame then the risk of downside is reduced i mean when i say that the risk of you losing money is reduced compared to where you started financial mistakes i was asked for my financial mistakes which is always an interesting question because you're having to sit there people who listen to this podcast know i often talk about things like this but you're sat there at the front and held up as uh, somebody who knows what they're talking about and then you've got to say to people this is basically what i messed up but interestingly they are the probably some of the most popular pieces because people realize that you are human and you are it's like the blooper new it's like the bloopers that you see it's almost you know when you're looking at programs the bloopers is always because you realize they're human yeah. and they make mistakes yeah. they're yeah. professionals but they make mistakes yeah and so that was quite a popular piece so my mistake was i regretted not making starting a pension earlier so everybody who will listen to this podcast and uh, money to the message will think that yeah dame's got a massive pension pot he's been sitting there bunging money in and the truth is i don't and the reason i don't is I'm aware of the reasons why, obviously now, why you do these things. But when I was young, auto enrolment didn't exist. Of course, that was only a a relatively new development. When I was young, I obviously just spent money. And you blew your paycheck. Why do I want to pay into a pension? I could have that money to go down to the pub. And everyone listening to this podcast is nodding away. And that is just the way life is. And sometimes you have other things that get in the way, like having a family, getting married, children and i wish i'd started a pension earlier but by that i mean put in a small amount away and it's that idea of compounding paying yourself first even if you just put 10 pound a month away 20 pound a month away if i'd done that when i was in my 20s then it would have just been the amount of money that i wouldn't really noticed that gone and auto enrollment does that it makes you put money away which is matched by your employer which is why it's so fantastic the, the amounts you put in in auto enrollment won't necessarily give you the best retirement. You prob- you do really need to add a bit more over time, but particularly if you're older. But what starting earlier did or would have done is it would have enabled me to have a sound base now rather than having to play catch up. So that's my mistake. So if you're young, listen to this podcast. Make sure you go to your employer tomorrow, ask them what the amount that they will match, the contribution levels you have to put in and then do it because it's free money so if they if you have to put in some money and they match it then that's free money from your employer do it start it's only a small amount yeah and of course you get that extra little bumper by getting that tax relief as well put on in the end so, so yeah all and all that's up so that's a brilliant point by andy yeah you get the honey you're getting the employer's kicker you're getting the kicker from the tax relief on contributions from the government as well so do make sure that you go and ask that question tomorrow if you're already not in your company scheme should you invest ethically is a question I get asked a lot. And I was asked on that panel discussion. And it's up to you whether you should. But it's the, 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 the follow-up question is, does it impact return? So does being ethical mean that you earn less money? And the answer is no, not necessarily. So it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to make more money. But if you look at the ethical funds that are out there, there are a lot of funds that all look like they've done brilliantly they've been top of the tables so you end up believing that investing ethically is far better than not investing ethically if that makes sense and you have to be careful because the reason that occurs is that ethical investing tends to especially in equities they tend to favor technology stocks and smaller companies so they go for these early startup companies in those particular niches And those two themes are two themes that have done very well in recent history. So if you took the last seven, eight years, if you'd invest in technology or smaller companies, they were themes that have done well generally. And so that gives a skew towards ethical funds. It makes them look like real winners, but there is an underlying bias towards those types of funds. Um, the- Anyone that doesn't know about ethical funds, by the way, the, these are funds basically that don't invest in things like tobacco companies, maybe oil and gas and things that are basically wrecking the planet. 
planet or people. Is yeah, right? it, yeah, good point. Uh, the ethical funds vary on what they invest in. So some funds screen positively. So that means that they go and only invest in things that are doing some social good. Right. And there'll be some mandate or charter that they will adhere by. Some basically ethically screen, but in a negative way. So they say we won't invest in companies that do these bad things. So it's a slightly different way of doing it. And some take a more balanced approach to it. But of course, that does mean that the ethics, that you, you have to really look at the ethics. So the, the, the rules that they're going to adhere to on a fund by fund basis, which is obviously time consuming. And the reason I point that out is because Anyone who's listened to anything we've done previously on ethical funds will know of the issue with oil companies and financials of banks. So often those types of companies do appear in some ethical funds. So that would mean that HSBC might be in an ethical fund and it is a quite a large holding in some of them. And of course, HSBC have been in trouble for money laundering drug money in South America. So you could argue, well, that's not ethical. And of course, you've got oil companies some big oil companies have, who had some environmental disasters and questionable practices with it, with their employees as well. So you're looking at that and saying, well, that's not ethical at all. But you buy one of those funds and they would be um, in, within them. So you have to make sure you look at it case by case. The difficulty is it's hard to find the funds in the first place because they're not often, but they may be marketed as an ethical fund, but there is no sector. So there's not an ethical sector out there that you could go, oh, I'm going to go and pick those ethical funds. So you have to go and try and find them. And it's quite difficult to do that. But interestingly, Interactive Investor, the fund platform, has just released a screening tool that allows you to look at funds and their ethics. So you don't have to buy through them to use this. It's a tool that exists on the site. So if you're interested in ethical investing, go and look at this new tool that Interactive Investor have produced. The other question I'm often asked is, how much do you need to retire? Um, that's It's a bit of a finger in the air. It very much depends on your what you want to do in retirement. Don't forget that when you do retire, people sometimes overestimate how much money they will need. Because if you think about it, your mortgage would likely disappear. You might not use a car as much. Your, your What happens is your spending patterns change. You might spend more on holidays in the beginning, but then as time goes on, with the best will in the world, you start to be become slightly more or slightly less able and you might not do as much as you used to do so your spending can start to reduce but then you can pick up again later on because of care so you have to be realistic about the amount of money you need for the average person as a rule of thumb if you were the average person with a state pension and you were earning an average income of around about 25 grand a year then if you think about that 13 times so unlucky 13, remember, 13 times what you uh, uh, what you earn currently is about the pension fund size you need to be able to sustain a similar lifestyle. Next point, uh, investing. Everyone talks about how much you should make and what you should be investing in and increasing returns. And the real message is investing is a story of get rich slowly. It's not about trying to shoot the lights out. You can do that, but you'll start to venture into the world of speculation and Investing should be relatively boring. It shouldn't be about, it should be you trying to work out the fund you need, the rate of return you need, what inflation is, and just work backwards and go, right, I need to either up my contributions or it shouldn't, it actually isn't an or, it's an and or, try and increase my returns by taking more risk if I'm comfortable with it. And we've got calculators, we've got a retirement calculator on our site. So if you go into Money to the Masses and look for the pension calculator, we've got one that can help you understand the amount of money you could have in retirement, what your income might be. You can play with it and what return you might need. I like the fact that you can reverse engineer it. You can kind of put in what you what you aspire to and, and work it backwards. Exactly. Right. Reverse engineer is the best way of describing it. It's a calculator that allows you to do that. So do have a play around of it if you do nothing else this weekend. At least you'll get a realistic estimate of what you're going to have in retirement or be able to build a, a plan. Another question I'm often asked is who to follow. And as a woman... It is a, it's interesting because you don't always want to hear from a man talk about money. So two people I want to sort of to recommend, really. Again, I met them this week at the conference. I was aware of them beforehand, actually, but I met them at one of the conferences we did this week. Catherine Morgan, who runs a podcast, interestingly, called In Her Financial Shoes. She's got had a similar journey to me. She's a, she's 
uh, worked in the city. She's actually a regulated financial advisor um, who's sort of pulling away from that world a bit and doing more financial coaching. So check her out. And uh, Mama Furfa is a YouTuber who uh, is Mama Furfa, F-U-R-F-U-R. Her name's Jennifer. It's a play on that name. And she does some really good investing videos, actually, and she's a really nice person. They've got a great story. And, of course, most of you, if you don't already listen to Pete Matthew, who I always recommend at Meaningful Money, he's got a brilliant podcast, too. So I think that will, I'll, I'll finish this piece. I just noticed the time I've been going on. I could do this all day. But, of course, ask me these things on Tuesday when you come along to the show. You can ask this and more, and I'll give you the answers. And one final question, really, I'm asked is about funds over shares. Do you invest in funds or shares? Now, the next piece goes on from this, and I'll elaborate on that. So the next piece on day trading and holding shares. Yeah, good stuff. So let's move on to that then. Day trading and shares. Do you know what? They scare me. For me, it's it, it's a gambler's game, but I don't know enough about it. I leave it to the experts. What it, What is day trading? Do you know, and I keep seeing these adverts lately for football index, which seems to be playing on the whole day trading, but with football. I don't know if you've seen them, but I, I look at it and it just scares me. So Yeah, I, what is, I, you can own funds, okay? So a fund has a fund manager and that fund manager uses a team of analysts and research and goes and buys a whole host of shares in companies. He does all the work for you. So it's like Helena Morrissey. She was a fantastic manager. There will be a range of people. You, you get teams of managers. So you'll get like, you'll get women fem- uh, fund managers. Ironically, women have been shown to be better than men. Um, I'll just have that dig at men out there. It's, uh, it's it part- shouldn't be ironic, but um, it is because of how the industry well, That's is. what I mean by the yeah. irony is that everyone goes about fund managers and automatically will default thinking it's a man and everybody slips into it. it it's well, unfortunately one of those things, but women do tend to be better fund managers. So um, a real hooray for women there. You get teams of fund managers, so you can have people where there isn't actually one fund manager. But what they'll do is they'll pick all the portfolio of shares and you put your money into their fund and you don't have to worry about who they pick. And they do the hard work for you. You just got to pick the best managers, which is effectively what 8020 Investor does. It picks the best funds. And if you want to find out more, of course, you can go and get a, a free trial. Now, there are people who want to pick individual shares. You need to have the time to do this. I would never do it. I don't have the expertise or time to be able to go and pick shares. Because if you're going to buy a share in a company, you need to be able to look at their accounts. You need to look at what they're doing there, um, forecasts, understand their business models, what the world is doing, what the competitors are doing, to be able to understand whether they represent good value and whether you want to buy and hold them and when to sell and when to buy. And that is very difficult. Now, There are people who do that and will day trade as well. So what they will do is they'll buy and sell shares at quite a rate and will move in and out of things very frequently. And there was some research that was carried out on, on, it's actually in Brazil, that was carried out on 20,000 day traders. So these are the people who sit down perhaps in their pyjamas in front of a screen and play the markets for the day and then come away and see how much money they've made. And it will be very short-term trades, a lot of these. I won't necessarily be buying and holding for the long term. And the adverts, like Andy say, make it seem like it's very easy. You've got this great lifestyle. Social media is terrible for this. Social media, and then particularly Instagram and Facebook, are rife with adverts saying about how follow me and I'm going to be, I'm a fantastic day trader. You'll be pictures of jets and cars to make it sound easy. Now, the research analysed what these 20,000 traders did. And ironically, the longer they did it, the less successful they became. So they, the more, the longer they followed these people, the less money they made. And out of the 1,551 people who did it for 30 days or more, 97% of them had lost money. Yeah. And 0.4% of them had actually earned more money than somebody who had just gone and worked in the bank, for example. Right. So it is a game that is, uh, I want to say a mugs game, but it's a, it's one that the odds are definitely stacked against you. And so realistically, if you're going to get into it and you've not had a background in it and you haven't got the time to really understand what you're doing, the odds are you're going to lose and you're going to lose money. And and, and why is it? Um, the reason is because trading short term is actually harder than trading long term because short term patterns fluctuate massively. So if you'd listen to this week's 
episode of Midweek Markets, I talked about the oil spike. Now, the oil price leapt 20% in a day. If you were trading oil, for example, and you would that would have gone against you massively and you would have been sitting on some heavy losses, especially if you were shorting the price of oil, it's much harder to predict what's happening on the short term than it is the longer term. Because, like as I said, longer term, you might be betting on something going up for reasons that are much more than the nuances that go on today. It might be down to trends in markets rather than just what's going on in a particular company. And so that is easier to do. It's not easy, but it's easier to do. And because in the short term, you get those wicked gyrations in stock prices or commodity prices, whatever it is, Bitcoin, whatever you're doing, it's harder to keep your emotions in check. So you start to panic, you start to get fearful, or you start to get greedy. And that encourages you to make the wrong trade at the wrong time. If you've got a longer time frame, you can start to sit out some of these fluctuations and just focus on your long term goal. And I want to give you a historical example of this. Again, we talked about it, the personal stories are the best ones. And I remember, and I'm not going to name the company, but I remember a company I worked for, and there was a hot tip that went around the office. Now, these guys were, um, they did, they did a, they did the portfolios and the financial advice for rich people. I'm talking people who had over a million pound a year. Very good at what they did, but they were running their own, obviously, personal money in the background. They didn't buy and sell stocks and anything like that. They bought, built portfolios. And in fact, they, outsource a lot of their investment stuff to discretionary fund managers so the big investment banks so they weren't even picking the funds themselves and there was there was a hot tip that someone got based around a company called Rockhopper and you won't necessarily know what Rockhopper is but it's a oil and gas exploration company that goes around and digs holes in the ground in the middle of the Atlantic or whatever and this often around the Falklands like prospecting for oil and gas yeah and if they spend a lot of money digging these like holes and trying to put up rigs to be able to if they strike it rich then boom the share price goes up that's their business where they go around and explore and somewhere in along the line someone's reading or hot tip they got from some fund manager there was this they were just about this company was just about to, to hit strike it, it rich strike it rich <laughs> and Brilliant. just off the coast of the Falklands. And every day, there were sort of a couple of hush conversations between these advisors. Oh, yeah, the price of these, these shares are ridiculously cheap. They're almost pence. And it, if it go, it will be going up like hundredfold and all this. These guys are very smart. They weren't the kind of people you think would get into gambling, which is effectively what they were doing. And um, it started, to, the conversation started getting overheard by other people in the office. And another person, another person. And it was all this, oh, yeah, don't mention to anyone else, though. Because, well, partly they were getting concerned it was getting a little bit out of hand, but partly because it was keeping this secret. It eventually got to the point that I was the only person in the office who wasn't really, hadn't secretly opened up a trading account and bought shares in this company. Now, emotionally, that felt quite odd because everybody else was betting their deposit for their house. One guy put his wedding fund on it. And they were buying shares in this company because they thought, well, do you know what? When this goes, because it's gone to, because we've been got the inside tip on this. The company, I think, the, I think the technical term is is a spud where they dr- drill and nothing happens. And I was in an office where there were lots of people not mentioning the fact that the share price had done the opposite and just basically raced towards a very low figure. And there were people like, no, no, it's the next one that's going to happen. And so this is how you get into that spiral of almost gambling because you're betting on a very short-term outcome. They were just about to hit an oil rig, uh, oil and strike it rich and the price was going to go up. But they didn't really understand what they were doing. It, and, and this is, if people who are working it day in, day out, very intelligent don't tend to get carried away with these things. It just shows how even if the first person who started the story really believed it, the others were just doing it because everybody else was doing it. And I think you have to be aware of that with day trade and things like that. So um, don't get caught out. It's the lack of knowledge and the lack of information, which is what also is a trouble because they had no clarity on whether these people were actually going to strike oil or whether there was about the industry. And that's what happens with traders. People who get into day trade without knowledge, they are trading against people who have more information than they do or have more knowledge because they're doing this on scale against institutional investors. And the other thing that kills it is costs. The more you trade, the more costs you pay. That ends up um, eating away your money. So there you go. What would happen though? Just thinking about it, I would say that the, the markets need these people because these people that are making a loss are helping to fuel the markets for everyone else to make gains. So 
what would happen if like the penny dropped and all these day traders thought, damn, we're losing a lot of money. I, I, I think the people who need these are the brokers because yeah. it's the brokers who make the money. And the other thing to bear in mind is that the, at the time where the retail investors, so when I talk about retail, that's me and you, the man on the street, get involved in something. The institutions have already been there. They're backing away. And so therefore it's them that are making the money out of Prime the retail. example of that is Bitcoin, I'm assuming. Yeah, well, lots of the institutions didn't really get into Bitcoin, but it is a, an example where... Um, if your barber's talking about it. If your it. barber's <laughs> talking about it, then you've got to be worried and it's probably a bubble. But that's what happens. So you get people jump in on something and the institutions have probably already made some money or losses and they're backing out. And so do be aware. So I'm not knocking day trading. If you want to get involved, you can do dummy accounts. You can do demo accounts. So IG is a platform that will let you test. So if you're going to get involved... This isn't an anti-day trading piece. It's really the warnings of experience of other people. If you're going to go into it, go into it with your eyes open. There's demo accounts where you can practice trading in a real environment. Like It feels like a real live environment, but you're not actually using any money. But do be aware that what you do in a, a, a practice area, what you do in the real world, is very different. It's like going down the driving range, and what you do in the driving range is very different to what ends up happening on the golf course. Anyone who's played golf will know what I'm talking about, and the risks you will take with pretend money are very different than you do with your own money because your emotions then get involved with real money. But another thing, if you want to learn more of people who've done it successfully, then rather than listen to people on Instagram and selling you courses online, go and have a look at Naked Trader. So it's a book called Naked Trader that was one of the best-selling finance books of recent times, really, written by a guy called Robbie Burns, who used to write a column in the uh, Sunday Times, actually, about trading and making it for his pension fund. He actually runs a website called nakedtrader.co.uk. Like I say, it's a very popular book. I think a new edition has just come out. It gets regularly updated. And you'll find much more information in there and tactics and advice. So if you're interested in getting into this, then do so with your eyes open about the risks. For most people, probably just investing in funds is a much more sensible um, way to get into investing and a much more well, certainly less risky good stuff so we're moving on to our last piece which is um, about the vulnerability registration service which is a not-for-profit organization and uh, i'm going to tell you a bit about it if that's okay then go for it i mean this is a great idea we met these people and andy spoke to them at length at the event and uh, every now and then you come across something that i think is uh, worthy of being mentioned on the podcast so andy you take it away Great. So the Vulnerability Registration Service is a not-for-profit organisation whereby you as an individual can self-register if you believe that you, there might be a future issue with, in terms of gaining credit for things. So let's say, for example, if you've had a, a history of gambling, a history of um, problem debt, if, you've, uh, if you're if you a manic spender, if maybe you've got mental health issues where uh, you find it difficult to make decisions uh, or you have up days and down days, maybe you're bipolar, um, or it could be someone that's a relative that you have power of attorney over who really doesn't have the capacity to make decisions concerning credit and who you think might be vulnerable to maybe um, not necessarily scams, but to people calling up sales calls and signing up for things they don't really understand. So the vulnerability registration service is a self-registered service. There are two things you can do, Damien. You can self-register for an auto decline, which will basically mean once you're on that service, whoever you're applying to in the future should hopefully check this register and auto decline you based on the fact that you've said you don't want credit. So really, that's probably manic spenders and gamblers and people who have had issues in the past. Or instead, you can register to be as a what they call a flag. So if you register for credit or a credit card or, or a gambling organization, it should flag at their end and you'd probably receive a call from someone to say, look, we know you're on this register. Just wanted to make sure you understand what you're buying here. Just wanted to make sure you're okay with it. And then it will go through that process and you'll get signed up for it. So it's a new startup company. It's a voluntary register that people can put their name on. And in terms of companies that use the register at the moment, I suppose the only downside at the moment is 
not everyone is using it. So not every gambling organization is using this service. Um, but the hope is that in time, everyone will, because there's a responsibility, especially being pushed by the financial ombudsman service on companies that offer credit, that offer services where people can have problem spending. So there's a responsibility for these companies to actually focus on this and almost prove that they're doing due diligence, that they're actually making sure that people aren't vulnerable to being put into debt and things like that. Yeah, so it's not legally binding for these companies, but the direction of travel seems to be that we're probably going to end up somewhere where hopefully it will be. And this company or this non-for-profit organisation is the, about the, one of the best things we've got that is going in that way that who knows in time, because I think there's about 10,000 people on it, isn't That's there? Right, yeah. So 10,000 people already registered on there as being vulnerable because you have to register yourself or you, if you have power attorney you can register somebody else who you have the power of attorney for if it's a growing it's like a groundswell of support for this and more and more companies have become aware of it eventually companies will probably have to be proven what they are doing to help vulnerable customers and if they're not aware of something that is obviously of a significant size that's doing it then the the FOS will probably be asking a few questions in the future so it's a nice idea because there are people like Andy said people who are gamblers who have problems with manic spending or who are just vulnerable sometimes like there was a good example of somebody who was sold a, a really expensive hearing aid yeah. but she was elderly and didn't really know what she was signing up for in terms of the credit arrangement that cost ridiculous like a grand or something like that so it it may be able to stop some of that it's not perfect nothing ever is but it's a step in the right direction does it cost to be on this no it's absolutely free to register there's no cost whatsoever and um, yeah if you know anyone that could benefit from this spread the word we think it's a good thing get the word out there i'll put details on the podcast itself on the notes and it's a vulnerability registration service.co.uk. But if you Google it, I'm sure you'll find it. Yeah, and some of the new tech startups have been much more ethical than their um, juggernaut peers on the high street, where they are starting to self regulate some of these things themselves, aren't they? There was, I think, is it Starling who've yeah. done it, where gamblers could block themselves from being able to use gambling sites. And there was a, I remember there was a fantastic story in the BBC of a guy who reckoned it really saved him um, and helped him. So not everybody does that. And hopefully companies will do that more and more. But there are organisations, particularly organisations who are the ones who are like the gambling companies themselves. They should be the ones who are regulating their activity, um, not, not just the banks who are doing it for them because they are being ethical. So this is something that's interesting. So go, do go and have a look at it. It's the Vulnerability Registration Service .co.uk is the website, so VRS, and you can find out more. Good stuff. So we're done for this week. If you want to get in touch with Damien, you can do so. It's Damien at moneytothemasses.com. On Twitter, it's at money to the masses with number two. Damien's all over Instagram. And of course, we've got our YouTube channel and we're uploading around about three videos a week. So if you're not on there and subscribed, you definitely should do so. Because if nothing else, if you're a fan of the Midweek Markets podcast, you'll be able to see Damien delivering that bit to camera and see how good he is at doing it. <laughs> right. See you on Tuesday. That's yeah. the big message. See you at the event. On Tuesday. On not, Tuesday. Not Tuesday. <laughs> no, on Tuesday. Yeah. See you on Tuesday. And for those of you who can't make it, then... Uh, well, we'll be on the show next week. Yeah, catch you next time.